Okay, so welcome to today's webinar on looking for growth opportunities in your business. And um, I guess there are a number of methodologies for looking at growth in your business. And, and we might do a couple of them in, in later webinars. But today I want to cover off on two really simple techniques. That we, one's called the growth strategy matrix and the other one's called the ERRC grid. And they're two simple methodologies that we can use to, to identify some growth opportunities in our business. Both come from different perspectives, um, but they're, they're both fairly useful tools for us to use. Why are we talking about growth? Well, in my experience, everyone wants to grow their business. There's not too many businesses that I talk to. I'm a, I'm a business coach and a business consultant. It's pretty much all I've done for the last 28 years. I work across a wide variety of industries from horticulture right through to mainstream business. And I, I guess, um, you know, that's manufacturing and those sorts of things. So broad cross section, not too many people don't want to grow their business. Yeah. Really important, though, that you do a bit of a reality check. So so look at your, your vision for where you want to go, where do you want to grow our business and what we're going to do. Do a little bit of a reality check and say, is that really what we want? Because I've done this in the past with clients and we've looked at something and said, yes, we want to have a business that turns over X million. And we've decided that actually that's not what we really want. We want the profitability that might come from that, but not necessarily um, the size that comes with that. And so there's some trade-offs. Anyway, so let's talk about growth strategies. So what strategies are we going to use to grow our business? And uh, this next matrix is in your workbook. Oh, sorry. And um, it's quite a simple matrix. It's been around for a long time. It's called the growth strategy matrix. Now, basically, there's two axes to this um, to this growth strategy. On the left hand side, we have the markets. And so these are the markets or customer groups that and we talk about existing and new. OK, so existing markets are markets you currently service. New markets are markets you don't current, can currently service. On the top axis, we then have products and or services. Now, I'm going to talk about products, but when I talk about products, I mean products and services, okay? So if you're in a service business, we're talking about the same thing. Again, we're going to look at existing and new. So what we end up with is a matrix where, where if you delivering existing products to existing customers is what we call market penetration. So if you have a growth strategy that's about delivering um, existing products to existing clients, it's about a market penetration strategy. If you're going to have a strategy where you're going to deliver new products to existing customers or existing markets, it's a product expansion strategy. So we're going to focus on that as a strategy. Likewise, if you're going to deliver new products, uh, sorry, existing products into new markets, it's a market expansion strategy. Fairly, fairly straightforward, so you're expanding into new markets. And the last one is where you're going to deliver a new product into a new market, and that's a diversification strategy. And so what we can do is then start to think about our business and start to say, if we're going to grow our business, where should we be growing it? Should we be doing new products, new markets, existing products, whatever? And you can start to, to build it around. So if you think about if we we're a car company, we might be saying, um, you know, there are, there are a couple of options here. In terms of the, um, uh, you know, the market penetration strategy, we could be saying, all right, well, let's just increase our advertising spend. So let's just get more people to, in our target market to buy our product. So increase our advertising spend. You could actually complete a new model. So, so you could actually, um, if you're going to want to deliver um, a new product to an existing market, you actually come up with a complete new model. So you come out with the new Camry or the new whatever, and, and people, your existing target base would want, want to buy that. But if you wanted to sell an existing product into a new market, you might just add some more features to it. So you might just sex it up a little bit, might add a sports pack to it or something else that's really existing products, but you just package it up differently. And then lastly, what they might do, if they wanted to diversify, they might create a whole new category of car. So BMW did that with their X6, you know, the the sort of crossover between a sports car and a four-wheel drive, rather odd-looking beast, um, quite popular though, despite that. And Mercedes-Benz actually started a whole complete class with their M-Class, and that started the whole thing of luxury sport SUV. So they created a whole new category, and they went into that. But if you're a horticulture business, let's say you're a horticulture business, then you might think about in terms of uh, existing 
products to existing things, about modifying the specifications of your product in order to um, sell more product into existing into existing clients. So you might modify the specs in some way. If you want to deliver, say, a, a new product to an existing market, you might you might decide we're going to market directly into the food surface surface food service market. Okay, plug that in. If you want to sell existing products into new markets, you might just try smaller pack sizes, same product but in a smaller pack size to go direct to consumers. So you might think about it. And lastly, if you wanted to diversify completely, you might value add by freeze drying or some other value adding or, or mechanical process that transforms your um, transforms your product. So that's how you do that for a horticulture business. A service business, I guess, um, you know, in a service business, you would actually sell the full range of services to your existing clients. Yeah. So your full range of products. Often, clients don't take on your full range. In uh, if you're looking to, um, I guess, uh, sell new products to existing markets, you could add a product to a service package. Okay. So you could add in some sort of uh, product, software product, or something in to to sex it up and make it a little bit different. In terms of delivering. Um, I get your existing products into new markets. You could create industry specific packages. So again, you just package it and tailor it slightly for a specific industry model. And lastly, if you wanted to uh, diversify, you might decide to create a whole new business unit and that could be recruiting or something else that your company doesn't do. So that's how you use a growth strategy. You start to think about what are some of the actions we can take in some of these, in each of these areas in order to give us some, some strategy where we can move forward. Now, why is it important that, that we actually sort of map these sort of things out? Well, it's important because these numbers actually represent the relative cost of acquiring the same level of new business in each quadrant. So what we're saying is that it costs seven times as much to acquire the same amount of business from a, a, uh, with a, in a new client into an existing um, market sorry, a new product into existing market. So seven times the cost. In terms of taking an existing product into a new market, it's about 14 times the cost of selling that or that same level of service or product into an existing market, uh, an existing client base. And the big one is diversification, 29 times the cost of, of selling something, an existing product to an existing client base. So really important about this is that you need to make sure you focus on the low hanging fruit first before you get lost in the thrill of the hunt. I find too many businesses get caught up in the thrill of the hunt. You know, we're going to go chasing new business and we're going to come up with new products. And we're going to do all this sort of stuff. And before we know it, we're trying to sell ice to Eskimos and we've not dealt with Eskimos before, nor have we tried to sell anybody, sell any of them ice. Okay. So be really careful about chasing off uh, on the new, you know, exciting stuff in the in the future, focus back into the boring old stuff and and sell. Look at what we can we do to sell into that you know existing products to existing clients and build up from it you know uh, from there. So it's really important that you do that. Okay, and the workbook you can fill in some of these things on page two. So there's some spaces for there for you to fill in the blanks and and to put in the the names around market penetration and other things. All right, so what I'd like you to do is just take a couple of minutes to write down something for your business in each of those boxes. So in each each sector there, I want you to take two minutes and I want you to write down one action that you could do to actually um, either sell more of your more of your existing products to your existing customer base or your existing market, if you like, um, and then just move around the matrix and say, what could I do? Now, when you've got a good action that, that you'd like to share with us, I'd like you to type into the question area. So when you've got a couple of actions, um, pick the best one and type into the question thing if you're game. Okay. So happy to have some feedback from you there. This is on page three of the workbook just quietly. So I'll give you a minute or two to think about that. So I want you to start thinking about those opportunities. You know, what's an action you can take to you know, sell an existing product into a new market? So what might that new market be and where could you sell it? Yeah. So how could you build that opportunity there? So just take a couple of minutes and think about that.
Yeah, so we've got, uh, um, Ian, thanks for that. Um, you could collaborate with other people to increase distribution. So you can collaborate with other, other businesses to actually increase your distribution of your existing products and your existing client base. It's a great one. So you can do that in a professional service sense. You can also do it in a product sense, um, where you could uh, where you could collate different different products together and and sell a combined package that that might work for a particular customer. Yeah. So you're sharing a customer base. Yeah, it's a great option, Ian. So taking a new packaging option that's grown one major client by 30%, um, that's that's fan, fantastic. So um, look at alternative packaging packaging options in order to uh, to grow. So sometimes it's it's subtle, simple changes that you need to make in your business that give you some of the some of the advantage that uh, that you need. So it could be as simple as restructuring your packaging or whatever. And sometimes it's a, it's perception. Um, you know, working with a client just just recently, and one of the things that that we found was that our uh, our clients um, we were enforcing our idea of quality on them, and um, and their idea of quality was far less than ours. So we we're actually able to sell them a lower quality product that met their needs, helped us because we could we could sell them a lower quality product, didn't have to put all the time and energy into into processing it, um, and the client was much happier. Yeah. So sometimes it's about talking to your clients. Okay, so we might just leave that, that ex exercise there. So were there any questions? Um, sorry, i got another example here. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, so um, Kate's saying you could grow another product for an existing market. So for an existing supplier, you could you could grow another product for a company that, that would already buy those off you, that you already supply with other products, so you could do something else. So that's great. So any particular questions that you've got around um, around the growth strategy matrix? I've got a minute or two just to answer any questions you may have around that. Right, Dan, thank you for that. Um, just one question here. We've got, uh, can you expand on what you mean by markets? Um, and uh, for me, that I'm talking about markets is either a customer group that works for you. They could be an A-class customer group or somebody you want to focus on, so a target market, or it could be a particular industry or demographic that you want to focus on. But it's a generally a large, a chunk of the marketplace that that you want to focus on. So I hope that I hope that helps. Okay. Um, question from Kate on how do you work out the costing in, in those new areas? Um, by trial and error, Kate. So part of that is been going and and looking at um, uh, other work that's been done, talking to other people that are doing the same thing, um, and uh, you know also getting sometimes it's a matter of getting some professional advice from from people with the right skill sets around that. So they may be you know agronomists or other people um, that are used to growing those those products and can give you the idea of costs and those sorts of things. Depends on the client. Often the Often the person, the client that you're delivering that product to, particularly if you're going to grow a, uh, a registered variety, may actually be able to give you a whole heap of that information as well. So um, I think it's a matter of doing your research well with all these things. Um, yeah. Oh, sorry. Oh, okay. Where do you get work out the cost? Um, I, they were sorry. <laughs> missed your point there, Kate. Sorry. Um, so Kate's asked the question: Where do the numbers, you know, one, seven, fourteen, and twenty-nine come from? They were some research that was done quite a long time ago, um, and uh, I'm actually not even sure of the source of them. Um, but it's there's some numbers that have been bandied around for for quite a long time. Um, every time I, I go looking for them, they're the ones that they that they come up with. Um, but it's really about the relatively, it's probably even, it's about the relative degree of difficulty in doing some, some of those things. Now, that doesn't mean that you don't race off and do a diversification product if it's worthwhile for you. Um, so you do your numbers and you and you and there's some risk with it, but it may well be worth the extra cost and hassle actually um, to do that. 
All right, we had another question then about where do you get your ideas from? Well, we're going to uh, address that now. So that's a that's a great question. So um, that just leads me perfectly on on to the next um, sort of uh, area. So I want to talk now about a, another tool, and this is really about about doing a bit of brainstorming around how you might come up with a new product um, or offering in the marketplace. And there's a um, a useful book. I don't know if you've read it. Be called called Blue Ocean Strategy. Um, and uh, it's a really good book, although no disrespect to um, to uh, Kim and Morborn, but um, I, I found it seemed to me like they reverse engineered the process. So I'm not actually sure if the businesses they talk about actually went through this this way this sort of uh, way of thinking to come up with their um, with their with their strategies, or they reverse engineered and said this is this is how you get to where they got to. Either way, a lot of the methodology and a lot of the stuff in this big book is really good. And I'm going to talk about just one of the great tools that they come up with in just a second. Now, Blue Ocean Strategy is basically their their um, premise is that most businesses compete in the red ocean, and the, that ocean is red with the blood of competition. Um, and um, but if you can actually um, if you can actually um, create a blue ocean where you don't compete with those other businesses. So if you can create a new strategy so your business operates in a blue ocean, then there's little or no direct competition, then you have a much easier time. And sometimes that's just about being uh, innovative and different in your thinking and applying some of this sort of stuff. So we're going to talk about a simple tool there. The book's good. They use a number of examples. Um, they use Cirque du Soleil, which you'd all be familiar with, which really merged theatre and circus to come up with a, a high a premium product um, that's well respected around the world. Another great one, and we're going to use this as an example of a minute, is Yellowtail Wines, an Australian wine company that uh, took on the US market. So let's just talk a little bit about the the grid that they talk with, they talk about. And um, I guess the uh, the grid's what we call the uh, ERRC grid. That's about looking for new growth opportunities. And this is a great matrix because it actually gets you to think about your products and services and say, what can we do to, um, what can we do to, to build or redesign or develop a new product or a product out of our existing product offering? What can we do to change it and make it really different? And basically the simple the model is really simple. It says, what could we eliminate? So which factors that the industry has long competed on should be eliminated. Okay, so what could we eliminate from our from our current process? And I'll talk through some examples in just a second. What should we raise? So what factors should be raised well above the industry standard? So what can we lift that the consumer will really value and that we could take to another level? What could we reduce? So what things are superfluous and what could be reduced well below the industry standard? And lastly, which factors should be created that the industry has never offered or doesn't offer consistently? So it's a really simple model. It's just a matter of saying, let's pick a product or service and then let's work out what can we eliminate, what we could raise, reduce or create. So it's really important. So I'll just show you an example of how it works in practice. So this is Yellowtail Wines here. And this is what they call a strategy canvas. And I've got to be honest, I find it really difficult to get my head around it and, uh, and use in practice, but um, it, it illustrates it really well. So what they've done is plot a whole series of uh, factors along the bottom. So there's price, above the line marketing, aging quality, wine range, of various things down the bottom. And then they've plotted where the premium wine market was in terms of, uh, of all those things and where the budget wine, so their competition, so where, where they were. And then Yellowtail Wines said, right, what do we have to do? So if we use this model, what do we have to raise, eliminate, reduce or create? So Yellowtail took the US market by storm, an Australian wine producer, and they took the market by storm, really targeting new wine drinkers who um, who were unfamiliar with wine and wanted to be int introduced into it. So the things they raised, they raised the price above the budget wines so that so they could compete a little bit on, on, on quality. Okay. They eliminated they eliminated the jargon. Right, no? So they eliminated the jargon that intimidates people who aren't in the wine industry. So they got rid of all that. And they use really simple terms to, this, to describe things. They got rid of all the above the line marketing. So all the high end advertising, TV, radio, or print advertising, all that sort of stuff. They stopped all, all that and kept their, their, their costs low. Um, 
they um, so they, they limited those things and they they eliminated uh, the aging quality thing. So they didn't talk about the age of the wines and that sort of stuff. They just talked about quality. What did they reduce? Well, they reduced vineyard prestige. So they, they didn't talk about vineyard prestige and make it all snobby. They made it about wine for the people. Wine complexity and wine range, they simplified. They came up with simple names. They had a dry white. I think they had a sweet white and a red wine. That's all they had. And you could go in and buy those. Yeah. So they, they made that sort of stuff. And what did they create? They created a really easy drinking environment. So they made it really easy to select the wine and they made it really easy to be seen to be drinking wine and, and it didn't have to be a snob and you didn't have to feel inferior when you went into the bottle shop to buy it. They also put some fun and adventure into it. They, they got people in the shops. They trained up the people in the shops about how to sell their wines. And they also got them to wear a Kubra hats and dries of bones and that sort of stuff and made a bit of, bit of fun and adventure around it and tied into that sort of Crocodile Dundee type Australian image, um, which, which worked really, really well for them. So that's how, how Yellow, Yellowtail Wine did it, and they were very, very successful. How might you do this? So what sort of things, if you're in a, so let's say you're in a, a service business like an accounting practice, what sort of things could you do? When I started to think about it, I thought about what sort of stum, stuff would you eliminate? Well, you could eliminate your jargon. So if you're, so if you target market, so you have your target in, in mind when you're doing this, but if your target market is um, you know small business owners or business owners or something else, um, you could have, you can eliminate the financial jargon and the standard profit and loss and balance sheet things, which most people don't understand, and put the information in simple terms. You could raise the level of analysis, so you could actually do a lot more of analysis of the financials rather than just giving a P&L and a balance sheet. You could actually do some analysis of it and show people what it really means, provided they're simple concepts and you put them in place. What would I reduce? You reduce the number of amount of reports and paper and all that sort of stuff. And, and give me just a, a summary of it and put all my information onto a memory stick or a CD or something or hide it in the cloud or somewhere else, but don't give me reams and reams of paper. And what would you, what could you create? You could create strong linkages to personal goals and future lifestyle goals and those sorts of things, maybe with some sort of lifestyle tracker or something. So, so you could create something really different that appeals to that target market. Where it appeal to everybody, but if that's your target market, it's what you could do. If you're in a horticultural business, you know, and you're, you're looking to sell different products, one of the things you could do is uh, you could eliminate is bulk packing. Yeah, okay, so you could you could just have uh, really you could come up with a really nice pack. You could raise the quality, so you might say, let's create a premium product, a super premium product, an uber product that's hand wrapped and something else. So you could really raise the quality. You could reduce the pack size, so instead of having you know. 18 kilo boxes you could bring it back to a nine kilo or a six kilo box of prime fruit that you really have and you could create a real prestige around your brand is the create thing so there's lots of stuff that that, that, that you can do um and guess what i want you to think about what you can do so i want you to think i've said in pairs here but obviously you can't do it in pairs but what i want you to do is is again to think about a product or service in your business and a target market that you might say and say, what sort of stuff could we eliminate? So what stuff could we eliminate that that the industry has competed on that should be eliminated? Okay. What don't the clients value necessarily that we could get rid of and it wouldn't make any difference? What should we raise? What do the clients really love that we could raise and make and make um, you know a real song and dance about? What could be reduced? So we don't want to get eliminated, but what could could we reduce? And lastly, lastly, are there any factors that we need to create? So again, just take a couple of minutes and um, and just um, think through what are some of the actions you might take in, in applying the ERRC grid to your business, to a product or service. Again, if you've got a good idea or two, just whack them in the questions area. This one's a bit difficult, a bit more difficult because it's about brainstorming and really thinking about products. It's well worth putting some time into. And I actually find it's a lot easier if you just go with the things that are on the top of your head. So put down the first thing that jumps into your head when you think about what would I get rid of? Because they're often the things that you've been thinking about 
and your intuition is telling you they're the things we need to go um, that we need to get get rid rid of. Got some stuff here. What we got here? Yeah. Um, yeah. So something from Shane here saying, looking looking for a niche. So you could you could uh, look at something the competition are doing. They're doing other other things. Yeah. Yeah. So you're looking at a niche where other people have spoken about it but not started. So you can look at a new product area. So you might eliminate some of the other things that that, uh, that, uh, that you can do. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. So we can reduce the supply chain, Tim. Um, I'm not sure how you do that as a collective, um, but yeah, certainly we're thinking about how do how do we reduce the amount of uh, product in the supply chain um, so we all benefit. Yeah. What are what other things can we can we apply this EOC grid to? So what are some of the things that spring to mind for you? All right, well, we're going to leave it there and move on anyhow. So some good ideas there. Encourage you to go back and spend some time in this one. It's a great model. It's really worth putting some effort and some thinking in because it can allow you to come up with something that you can do very, very different to the competition and that you might be able to uh, give you a real competitive advantage around. I guess... Um, yeah, so... Uh, one of the suggestions from Kate is that we could improve the coal chain um, all the way through from the supermarkets right through to the shelves. So maybe that's something we can do as a as a process that we can um, we can get together and you can control all the way through. And maybe that's something you do not even through the supermarkets. Maybe it's a, a thing that you do by going direct to consumers or direct to a uh, you know providors or something else. All right. So, a question from uh, yeah, uh, from Joseph. Can we eliminate the middleman? Yeah. So you might go direct. Yeah. It's it's a great option. Now, Joseph, it's, it's something you may not do with um, with uh, um, all your all your product, but but you may take a selection of it and go direct and cut out the middleman and go direct to the consumer or a supplier or another wholesaler. So that sort of thing can definitely be done. All right. So. Number of number of things there. Um, question here about the yellow tail diagram. Um, do we have to convert our plan into that diagram? No, you don't necessarily have to. Um, the canvas is just way of pictorially looking at it. The important thing is that you brainstorm some of the uh, some some of the actions, um, and uh, and go from there. Um, Tim, I'll, I will open up the mic at the end, so let's just get through in case people have got to go, and then I'll open up the mic and we can have a bit of a chat around some, some of these things and talk about some of these things. So I will up, open up the microphones at the end. Um, and do you have to have something in every box? Um, no, you don't have to. Um, so, uh, but I'd encourage you to do it to do that simply because it will help you um, it help you brainstorm a lot better. If you think you can get away with it, then you just won't do the hard thinking. So think through every box. All right, on the home straight, and we'll wrap it up and everything else. So in summary, I guess there are things to think about. There are plenty of growth opportunities out there. We've just got to take them and look at them, okay? Um, make sure you do your research. Ensure that they're commercially viable. I'm not saying just race out and try different things, but sometimes you've got to put your toe in the water and test a few options and work it through to get it right. Don't forget to focus on the low-hanging fruit. Too many of us get caught up in the thrill of the hunt, um, so don't forget to focus on that low-hanging fruit, fruit and then use that EAAC grid to really redesign your products and to think about the services that, you're, that you want to do. And the last thing is, is take action. Make sure you develop a one-page plan around this. And in the, in the course notes, I'll actually send you a link to a one-page video and put a one-page template there for you to go and build a one-page plan for, you, for your business. So... Um, Really important that you uh, that you really take action out of this and have it and have a go and start to look differently in your business because there are too many people who just sit around coming waiting for things and never get on and do it. All right, so the next steps, you know, visit the website, watch other videos and uh, stuff in the in the webinar library. There are two um, websites here. SBD Business is, is my website, and if you're a, if you're a business um, 
then uh, business owner or manager, then you might want to go along to that. If you're a particular horticultural business, you might want to go to horticulturenextgeneration.com.au and, um, and, and look at the videos and all the sort of stuff we've got there. It's got more of a horticultural slant to it. Um, if you really want to, happy for you to email and call me to discuss growth opportunities and how you might be able to do this stuff in your business. More than happy to spend a bit of time with you and discuss that. My contact details are there. Um, and also don't forget that we are looking for 25 horticultural owners or managers to join our Horticulture The Next Generation program um, for 2014. Great opportunity, four days of training, some uh, individual coaching support, um, online training courses, online resource centers, a whole heap of things. Great networking opportunities, but more importantly, it's a real opportunity to do this sort of stuff, to take the time to work closely on your own business, to work in the business Sorry, we're calling the business rather than in it. All right, um, I'll open up the mics in just a second. Our next webinar is on converting revenue targets into cash. So we're going to talk about how to create an income matrix, how to get that to understand what sort of sales targets drop out of that income matrix and what we need to do, build that into a sales pipeline and then link it to your marketing and sales activities. And that'll be on Thursday, April the 24th, 5.30 p.m. Queensland time. Um, and we'll send you out um, some mailers and stuff around that. So um, really look uh, look forward to um, seeing you in our next webinar. Now, um, we're going to leave that there officially. Um, but uh, so if any of you have got to head off, you're welcome to. But uh, if any of you would like to ask a question or, or pose something to the uh, to the group, just uh, ask the question and I will uh, and I will um, and uh, I'll open the microphone up. Tim, something you want to say? I'll open you up. All right, Tim, you should. Russell. How are you, mate? Yeah. yeah, good, thanks. Hey, thanks for doing this. This is really great. What I was just uh, referring to before with the, about the length of the supply chain was more for individual farmers or horticultural suppliers to try and cut that supply chain down by using their location to access the market. Do you think? Yep. Yeah, no, so that's a, yeah. Um, yeah, that, and that's a good thing. So, so where can we where can we reduce that supply chain? I mean, it's a great thing. So, you know, and it, it ties in a little bit with what Kate's talk, talking about. If we can control the cool chain as well um, and shorten up that supply chain, then we pick up that. I guess the guess I guess the important thing there is to make sure that we don't lose the value. So often I find when we see advances in benefits in our supply chain and we start to shrink the supply chain, if we're not careful the upstream people, the supermarkets and and other people take that, um, those take those savings from us. So make sure you uh, okay to share some of the savings with, with the client, but if you're making putting all the efficiency and all the work in, make sure you keep some of it for yourself. But um, it's a good question. Um, thanks Tim. Um, also, uh, Kate's made a thing here. Yeah, um, yeah, you will have um, access, ongoing access to all these webinars, um, Kate. So we'll still be able to, to, to keep in touch um, over the next year or so. Um, any other questions or anybody else like to, uh, to make a comment? All right. Well, if we're all done, thank you very much for, for your time and for your attention today. Look forward to seeing you at our um, at our next webinar on the 24th. Um, keep uh, if you're not a subscriber already, subscribe to the newsletter at uh, either horticulturenextgeneration.com.au or my website, and we'll keep you fully informed about what's going on. And uh, I look forward to talking to you again. Have a great have a great couple of weeks, and we'll talk again in the future. Thanks very much. Bye.